Hello guys, I have promised to talk a little bit about software architecture. And as software architecture is a pretty vast topic, this probably won't be one of my 5 to 8 minutes videos. I haven't rehearsed this video also, so I don't even know how long time it will take. But I'm trying to get a little bit around everything. And remember, it is a huge and vast topic. So let's get starting with it. I found this little chapter thing from, La from the Craig Larman book Applying UML and Patterns. And what it basically says is a pattern is how you organize your program and what do you want to accomplish with it. Do you want to go for scalability, maintenance or security? So a software architecture is more like an agreement to help you organize your, pro uh, your program. The message bus architecture is about that you have components of your software that talk with each other to, uh, using a message bus. The good part here is that if you want to scale out, get faster and bigger computers and spread your application across many computers, your message bus bus will be shared across the network. But the message box could also be a local bus within the same architecture, within the, the same hardware. So this is very good for scaling. Then there's the client server. We all know a bit about the client server. This means that you have created some kind of client that holds some kind of the program. It could be an app. It could be a web page, or it could be a standard Windows application. And it has some centralized logic on the server. If it was an app, it could be a database with the data you're accessing through the web, through the app. If it's a web page, of course, we have the server as a backend tool. And it could be also a standard Windows application where you had some kind of logic stored behind it. We'll talk a little bit more about that during this session. Then we have this end here. An end here is a way to separate your program into more than one lump of hardware. Separating your piece of software into more than one lump of software. So this could be, as in this example here, a web browser where you have the web page on the client running JavaScript and HTML. You have the server, the web server, running the backend code. And you have on another server a database that stores your data. Then we have SOA, service-oriented architecture. And then there's the object-oriented uh, the object-oriented approach that we have talked about earlier. Okay, so back to the layout architecture, which, which this session will be mostly about. So a layered architecture is about choosing some rules. And some of these rules could be that top level layers can only talk with lower level layers, not the opposite way around. Every layer has its own responsibility and layers doesn't know about layers about themselves. And layers should be as loosely coupled to other layers as possible. So we don't want layers to be tightly coupled together. We don't layers, we don't want layers to talk with everybody surrounding them. In Larman's book Applying UML and Patterns, we have found this layering thing. On the top we have the UI. The UI here is HTML, XML. XAML and stuff like that. It is what your user interface is made of. Then we have an application. We have called it the controller layer for quite some time, but the application layer could also contain processes and workflows and etc. And then we have the mo uh, model layer. We have usually called it a model layer. And the model layer here is the domain model. This is where we model the things we are programming. Under that, he has a business infrastructure layer. 
that could be, as you mentioned here, a currency converter. It could be one of the helper methods, an underlying architecture. Then he has frameworks, higher level technical services, and lower level technical services. These are the frameworks that we are using. The higher level frameworks in the .NET environment could be, for example, Link, where else the lower levels could be, as you mentioned here, FRED, Structs, other utilities. The console write line would be placed here in the lower level. So usually we don't program the two lower levels. They are just merely there, but you can come into situations where you want to make something stored in the lower layers. Microsoft has made a book called Microsoft Application Architectural Guide. They have this architectural drawing. And they have a little bit of other... They use a bit other uh, naming. So here we have, for example, a user, which isn't something we are programming, but he interacts with our presentation layer. That is our view, our UI layer with presentational logic and UI components. That is our text boxes and our buttons and our pictures and stuff like that. And our UI here talks with our service layer. I'm not all that sure about what they think of as a service layer, but external systems, as they have mentioned here as well, have to talk with something within our application. And that's where a service layer, in my mind, makes most sense. Then it's sort of a pre-controller layer that can receive and execute orders from external systems. In this, we also have this business layer. We haven't really used the business layer that much. It's a mixture of more than one thing in the Laman world. So here we have an application facade, which could be the controller, or it could be just a facade to connect the user interface to the controller. We have the business workflow, which we haven't worked around that much. A business workflow is where a class can have different stages. So it could be a new user that aren't allowed to log in yet, that has to be confirmed and when he has confirmed, his states will change and he can log into certain parts and maybe is upgraded to administrator, then he can log into the whole system and manage stuff like that. So this is a workflow going from unknown user, anonymous user, to a user with some privileges to a full administrative user. It could also be a report that hasn't been done yet, an order that isn't quite finished yet, we can add more and more stuff into it, we can pay for it, and then we can order it. So they can have different stages in an object. And a business workflow is where we maintain these different stages. Then we have business components, which is more or less what we have done over time. And we have business entities. We'll talk a little bit more about what entities is later in this session. We also have Data access components, we know what that is. That is where we connect to our database. We have some data helpers and utilities. And this is specialized helpers. We have used helpers for a lot of different things. And here they have in the data access layer, they have data helpers and service agents. And service agents is, if you don't store your data in a database, you might store them elsewhere. And that's where you use your service agents. In this architectural plan, we also have the cross-cutting. These are layers going across all the other layers, and that could be security. Security in this manner is, if you're a new user and you don't have a lot of privilege, then the security level makes sure that you don't get into classes where you don't have anything to do. It could be operational management. It could be communication with other systems. It could be when you're logging stuff in your application. You could also both log in your secure, uh, service level as well as your business or data layer. 
even in your UI layer, you could do some logging. So in all layers, you might want to log stuff. Here we are showing you a little bit of the benefits of using layers. <coughs> I'll give you a moment to read about them. It's something like cohesion, it's extensible, it's lower levels that can be reused. Dividing the job of making your software into teams, each handling a layer or part of a layer, stuff like that. These are all benefits of a good architecture. So what could layers be? And we have talked a little bit about them. There's two different approaches in the Microsoft book and as well in the Laman book. So we have them user interface, we have user interface entities. We have application layer, we have business layer, we have business entities, we have helpers, logging, security, persistency and networks, and many, many others. Many of you applications will maybe use two, three, four of these layers. Or even you'll come up with your own layer definitions and naming for your own way of separating concerns within your application, depending on what kind of application you are doing. So let's talk a little bit about these confusing entities. The business entities will be what we have talked about as domain models. These are pure business data as I write here. As with the user interface entities, these are classes made entirely for the user interface. So when you are packing some data in a big lump that you want to display in your user interface, you could make an entity, a data entity where you store your data, a user interface entity, we could call it, where you store your data and ship that entity up to your user interface for the display. This way, we are not coupling the interface to the business entity. And that's important because your domain model, your business entities, shouldn't change over time, but you could get a new interface, a new user interface with a new workflow, a new way of doing stuff, and you don't have to change your domain model this way. So you make a new entity that matches your user interface that can store these data you, that you need in exactly that user interface. So you might have some kind of conversion between the business entities and the user interface uh, entities. We'll talk a little bit more of that later. And later is actually now. Because as you can see here, I have put up an example. This is strictly UI. These green stuff here are packages. And the package could be seen a little bit as a layer. So in this part here, I have the UI, of course, consisting of both some simple data validation in the code behind file, as well as some look and feel of your user interface. Then we have this application facade. That is our controllers, that is what our program will offer to the user interface. And we have the business logic is what we do with our data and the business entities, which is our domain model. We could also have in this example here, I have a network connection. So our business logic could search for data on the network as well as among its business entities depending on the situation, of course. And what happens here is that you have a request for coming from the user interface. You push a button to search for some stuff. Your request goes to the application facade that again connects to the business logic to find these data according to some business rules. These data will be stored in your business entities and will be retrieved in some order that matches the model that you have made earlier. And then the application facade gets these data. But these data are formatted in a way that matches the business, not uh, matches the UI. So then it translates, creates a new object of, the, uh, of a class that matches the user interface. And then it transform this business logic data 
business entities data into UI entities and just shift this one object up to the user interface to display these data. It can sound a little bit tricky, but let's look at it in a way you might understand better. If we now let's give it a new meaning. Earlier we made a domain model and it become classes and objects in our domain layer. Then we added a database and then somebody got confused. Where were our domain model now and how did we map it? So we had some exercise of mapping databases to domain model one by one. And that's one approach that gives a highly flexible way of accessing data. We could also have gone the other way and said, we take the entire domain model and, de and normalize it. Sorry, not denormalize. We take the entire domain model and normalize it into a database. So now our domain model will be tables, actually. Then we could add the business logic as stored procedures. This is not a must, it's a way to see it. So the business logic here would be stored procedures that knows that if you like to retrieve orders, we are joining orders, customers, order lines, and customer address, which is which each other, and get the data back. So this way we'll get an order full of order lines, maybe even with the different stuff you had ordered linked to it and the name of the person who has ordered this and the address it should be shipped off to. All this is bit business logic. And we're sending all these information from all these different tables through a stored procedure to the application facade. It transforms them all into a class that contains order lines, order, name of the person and address of the person because all this is what the ui needs at this win or window to show the use of the program exactly who are the customer and what has he bought so that could be one approach but business logic is not always stored procedures it could be it also could be c sharp code java c plus plus it could even be, be link entity framework stuff, where our business entities then would be database tables and entity framework classes. And your business logic would be using link on these entity framework classes. That would also be a way to do it out in the real world. <clears throat> Enough of all this. We need to look at some code. Time is ticking. So let's look at some Code. I have made a band. I have made. I have made a bank application, and this bank application has an ordinary loan, and it can generate a report on paper. That's a lousy bank. So what I need instead is to expand the bank services. So we want the customers to be able to see the loan reports through the internet. We want customers. We have customers who don't want to pay interest. Instead, they have to pay something else. So we need a new loan types. We have some customers <coughs> that don't want to pay the same amount of money each month. They want to pay a percentage of the entire loan. So when they loan a thousand bucks and they pay off 300, like 30%, the rest of the loan will be 700 and they'll pay off 30% of the 700 and 30% of that next month. So in this exercise, in our example here, we'll create a new report. We will create two or more loan types extra. We will be able to store reports either locally on disk or on a central database. Maybe even made it uh, make our program open for further technologies, for future technologies, technologies that hasn't yet been invented. So 
She has our program. Tiny little thing. So I have made a very bad loan calculator. And this is very bad because it takes a constructor with lots of data in it. It stores the data on class that is not ugly. And we have here a report it can generate. What's really bad about this is that this class now tries to do two things. It's both a loan, so it can remember all the stuff from the, for the loan, but it's also a report generator as well as a loan calculator. So it tries to be more than one thing at the same time. And if we want to make three different loans, the easiest part here would be to copy this class three times, call it bad loan one, bad loan two, and bad loan three, and then just change the loan calculation down here accordingly to the new loans. But then again, I said that we want to create different kinds of reports. And this report here is a paper report. It returns a string that you can print out on your paper. So, I want to make an internet report instead of this one, as well as maybe extraordinary reports, nice looking report, a detailed report, all kinds of reports. And these are in the same file as my loan. This is not cohesion. These are stuff that doesn't belong together, that are coupled together in the same class. So what we want to do is splitting up the loan part and the report part into two different classes. Because otherwise I should create a report 1, a report 2, and a report 3 within each class that actually do the same. So off you go. This was the bad stuff. Oh. Let's just show you that it actually works. So I just put a breakpoint somewhere here, for example, and I run it so you can see the report. So the report here is I borrowed 9 2000, I pay off 10,000 and I get some interest rate, interest, and I pay off some more and I get some interest and I pay off some more and I get some interest and finally I paid off my mortgage. <coughs> So let's remove the bad code. So now I have made a more complex loan here. Let's go to the loan. Oh, first of all, let's look at the interface. So this interface just has a calculate loan. That is because you can't have constructors in your interface. And I'll do most of my dating stuff in my interface. And I do it this way because then it's lower coupled. You can see I have the interface and I use a loan factory. And we can look at the loan factory here. It just tells us that if you're calling the create loan with lots of arguments, you'll get a loan type one. And if you do it with a few arguments, you'll get a loan type two. So let's look at this. And they are of I loan, both of them. So we can just return them. So let's look at the code here. So I have the same constructor as before. And now I have this loan calculator. It looks a bit like the one from before, but it doesn't, it returns i new build strings, which uses yield return. It's quite of need, so look at that. And, oh, sorry, go to this one and look at loan 2. So down in loan 2, we can see that we have the same basic part up here, as well as the loan calculator down here. But in this case, we calculate the loan a bit differently. So 
we deduct every payment and add a thousand bucks instead of interest rates. So this is our loan, loan two. And I use the loan factory to get you know, to generate the objects. And then I create and report and say this is a paper report of type with paper type free, whatever that means. And I have a loan here. I loan 100,000, I pay 10,000 per month. I have a 10% interest rate. And four, um, four times a year I pay my interest. And in the other loan I have here, I also loan 10,000 bucks and I also pay 10, sorry, 100,000 bucks and I pay 10,000 bucks. This is a web report. It is pretty obvious because I have an IP number instead of the paper type. It is called paper report instead of web report. But these are both I report types, so I use interfaces again. This means that I only couple it to the exact class type once, and in the rest of the program I use the interface. Then I have a report generator. And in this case, I just create this report generator, add the stuff into it here, my loan and my paper report, and then it generates the report. And here I can just write out the report data as well as I can with this one. The I report just contains the report data. So I have kept it fairly simple just to show you the principles in this one. But how do I do it? All this stuff. Okay, we have looked at the factory. It's very simple, just saying, if I call it this, I have some business logic that says, if these are my parameters, then this will be my loan type. So this is a fairly simple factory. But it keeps me to the grasp part where I say, where are my creator? And my creator is this factory and only this factory. And all the other parts of the program will just know a loan by an I loan interface. And that's a lower coupling than if I couple it directly to loan type one. So the hard coupling here, the high coupling is only in the factory. If we look at the web report, it's more or less the same, not using a factory, but the class itself. And then if we go to the generate report, you can see here that I take first an I loan interface and an I report interface. And then I do stuff with it. So at this point, I don't care what type of loan it is as long as it is, it is an I loan. The same with the report. I don't care if it's a web report or a paper report or a whatever report, as long as it is a I report. And as long as these two reports, sorry, as long as the loan and the report is an I loan and an I report, I can do this stuff with it. But it becomes better, even better. Because I also said that I wanted to store it. So I have here created a text storage called text storage. It could also be I storage, by the way. Like this. So I created, let's check if it works. It does. <laughs> Thankfully. So I created a text storage, and then I create a storage facade and add the text storage to it. Because now I can say that I want the storage facade to store a customer one paper report. Can that be as easy? So let's look at it here. It is. Sorry, here it is. Customer one text, and it looks like that. It's probably okay, but that is the way I have put up these 
data in it. <coughs> so why do we do it this way? Fairly easy to say it. If I want a database, I say iStorage uh, database storage equals new database storage, and I'll add my connect string here to whatever it is, and I'll say database storage. And the rest of the program can use the storage facade as always. Now I'm, now I'm just storing my data in the database instead of in the text file system. Let's remove all this and go back to the original. Like this. Just testing it works. <coughs> we can still get this here, so we still have the data. We can even delete them. Run the program, and we have the data yet again. So it works. This is a bit fascinating. If you want to fix something, let's say that you want to have a class that can connect to another computer using the network and you don't really know how to do it yet. Or it isn't part of the project uh, yet, but it will in a matter of a few months. Then you can do this, saying that I want a fake network class that you can build all your application against. And then the only thing you do is you change the fake network class to a real network class later on containing real network logic that can make your application communicate over the network. And then you inject that. So what I'm actually doing here is dependency injection, and we have talked about that. But maybe we haven't seen it as good as this yet. So let's look how do my text storage look. This is in the entire text storage of the interface iStorage. It has a path. Of course it does. This is the path where it stores its data. And it remembers that in the constructor. And it has two methods. Because at this moment I only need these two methods. So I have a write all. So I just write the entire report. And I have stored it in my path with a key name. So I could, uh, could have more than one text file. That text. Then I have this count report. Later on in this little TV show, I'll show you that I can count how many reports I have created. So this is all my text storage contains. And I said that uh, I have created a database storage as well, but I haven't done anything with it yet. So it's up to you to create this database storage. And in the same way, you could also say that I want to create a non-SQL access So you can create your own here, the same way I have done it. So this way my program is very highly extensible. I can create all new kinds of future scenarios using dependency injection. As I, you can see here, just remove that one. I inject where I want to store it in my storage facade. And then I just call my storage facade. And I can call this storage facade from all over my program. Because it will always store it using this class. So what my storage facade really does is, it stores my actual storage device 
which could be a file system, it could be an SQL server, it could be a non-SQL server, it could be future technology. As long as it is of type iStorage. And then I have my methods where I'm just routing them. So whenever I want to save something of type key and report, I route them onto whatever storage device I'm using at the moment of type iStorage. So that might be it, but not really, because the last thing I want to show you is what if I have a model that wants to display stuff to my user interface? And that's not legal according to our Arctic architecture. So what I do here is I have created an object and I call it Watch, watch for Changes. And what it really does here is it gets some pull every millisecond and it has somebody it should watch of type iStorage. Please watch it. And then I create a new thread storing these two. Continue pulling true. We'll look about that later. And then I create a new thread. Pull thread. And then I start the thread. And we know that whenever I have started a thread, I come down to here and this execute and my program sort of splits up into two parts. My main program that returns from the watch for changes method and a new part that is our new thread that is just started. And what my thread here really does is that every so many milliseconds it loops. So let's get a look here. Count. So it counts how many reports I have at the moment. And then it says while continue polling. You could have write, written down while true here, but then it would be hard to kill a thread. And you might kill it in the middle of a process. Using this, while polling equals true, I could just set continue polling to false and eventually the thread would stop. The first thing I then do is I wait. I put my thread to sleep for a certain amount of milliseconds. And then I count again. And if the count has changed, I remember the new amount. And then I call my notify. I want to tell everybody that subscribes to this event that there has happened a change. Something has changed. And then I do it all over again, and again, and again. And that's why it's called polling. I'm asking, 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 asking. And most of the times I'll get the same answer. Then I don't have to notify, of course. But you have to remember that if you have a database, and if you have a thousand clients or a million clients, this polling thing is not the best approach. The best approach is, of course, to subscribe to your data changes. And newer SQL servers, SQL 2012 and 2014 and newer than that, they can sub uh, there you can subscribe directly from C Sharp to data changes in your tables. I'm not sure if you can do it on 2008 R2 or 2008. And you are still not able to do it using the Azure database. But hopefully it will come. Okay, what is this notify thing here? Let's jump to it. So the notify is just simply a method that invokes all my subscribers with my message every time it wants to tell my subscribers something. And of course I have a subscriber on method here where you can subscribe. What and what's holding all this together? is partly my events here, where I store all my subscribers, and partly up here something that's called a delegate. A delegate is a method pointer. And we haven't talked about method pointers yet, so you just use them, maybe look in the book and read a bit about them. 
So what I'm actually doing down here is that I, first of all, I set it up saying that I want to watch for changes. Every thousand milliseconds, I want to look for changes in my storage facade. Not in my text storage, but in my storage facade. And it says, okay, I'll do that. And then I said here that I want my watch for changes to subscribe on methods. And when something happens, call my beep method down here. And just to show you here that I can stop the program in two steps, so I put in here a read key that waits. And when I push the read key, I set my continue pull into false. And then when it's put to false, we know that my thread will stop eventually. So then I'll say I can finish my program. I do this because if I just try to end my program here, while I have a thread running on the loose, my program won't shut down. It won't kill all the threads, so you have to kill the threads, stop the threads in some way before you stop your program. Okay, let's see if this works. Come here. So what happens is that I generated first the first loan here, using the good way of doing it. And then I have made the second loan. You can see here that it's lowered by 10,000, added 1,000. Lower by 10,000 again, add a new thousand in, and stuff like this. It's actually taking longer to pay the debt, not 11 months, but 12 months. Then it says push key for to end a fret. But I want to show you what happens here. So now I'll just create a new report. Not in my program, just in my file system. Boop, beep, new number is two. Let's see if we can do it so we can watch them both. You can see, we can actually do like this. We can say copy, new number is six. So what we know here is my program is down in this path and making a count on all these objects. And it does that on a second basis. So every second is down here counting them. And when it changes, it tells all the subscribers that it has changed. And I can put a key. Full thread has ended, and now I can end the program. So what should a layer be? It should actually say, what should a good architecture be like? So what are my recommendations? And these are, of course, be careful about where and when you create new objects. I use the facade and, um, sorry, I use the factory in some cases, and then I use lots of interfaces. Interfaces decouple my classes. I have a clearly defined responsibility for each layer and for the classes within each layer. So I know when I add new functionality, I know which layers to add this functionality to. And if you should add it to an existing class or create a new class, because all that depends on responsibilities. As I said, I use a factory pattern whenever I can imagine to create more than one object. When the factory pattern is very nice. Um, there are other, other creational patterns that you can look into. The simple factory pattern is just the simplest of them all. Then I use dependency injection or inversion of control, which is also two patterns. I use threads only when it's necessary. And then I use the observer pattern, as you've seen, just to make 
my model layer be able to contact my view. That was all I wanted to show you in this over 40 minute video. Sorry that it just becomes so long. And thanks for watching.